hey guys uh, welcome back and today i'll be talking about the biosynthesis of the thyroid hormones before going to the biosynthesis uh, we should have a bit knowledge about the anatomy of the thyroid gland so when you see a thyroid gland um, you will be finding two lobes and these two lobes are connected by means of isthmus so when you look into the lobes this lobe will be contain large number of lobules these lobules are nothing but the acini and this acini will be lined by a epithelial layer that epithelial layer you call it like the follicular epithelium follicular epithelium so when you see this as a lobule so inside this is called this entire area this is called the colloid and it is surrounded by the actually it is lined by this follicular epithelial cells so look at this this is the follicular epithelial cells and uh, this the pink colored uh, staining structure which you could see in each lobule is colloid and this colloid will be having a glycoprotein called the thyroglobulin so tg here represents a thyroglobulin so once again so the lobes will be con the lobe of the thyroid gland will be containing many lobules and each lobule or the acini will be lined by the follicular epithelium and it is filled inside with the pink colored proteinaceous material called the colloid and this colloid will be having the glycoprotein called the thyroglobulin so i have represented that it as t g thyroglobulin so now let us come into the discussion that is a biosynthesis of the thyroid hormones so there are many steps in synthesis of the thyroid hormones so before going even to the steps now what are actual materials we require for synthesis of this thyroid hormones so the raw material for thyroid hormone synthesis are iodine and the tyrosine so where is this tyrosine present that is present in the thyroglobulin i have told you that the colloid will be containing the thyroglobulin so thyroglobulin is a glycoprotein that is having 123 tyrosine residues so that becomes a source of the tyrosine so the raw materials are iodine and tyrosine now what are all the sources of the iodine as the tyrosine is already present in the body in the form of thyroglobulin and it is also taken in the form of of uh, some proteinaceous food uh, the sources of iodine comes like the dairy products the milk yogurt sea uh, seafood and fish so these becomes the sources of the iodine so how is this absorbed iodine in the body is converted into iodide and this iodide anion via gastrointestinal tract it is absorbed and when goes into the circulation from the circulation it is being trapped by the thyroid gland and used for synthesis of the thyroid hormone synthesis now let us go into the steps of the thyroid hormone synthesis see the first step here is iodide trapping so i have told you into the circulation the iodide is getting absorbed as a iodide ion so in the circulation we find iodine as iodide so the iodide is being trapped by this thyroid gland now later synthesis and secretion of the thyroglobulin now what is this thyroglobulin thyroglobulin is a glycoprotein so the name is itself tells glycoprotein it is made up of 10% carbohydrates and will be having 123 thyroxine residues and will be having two subunits and has a molecular weight of 660000 okay now this becomes a second step now what is the third step the iodide which has been trapped by this thyroid gland is now oxidized into the iodine iodine molecule now later organification of the thyroglobulin later condensation or the coupling reaction and finally the release of the thyroid hormones these are the order that is a sequence uh, which you could represent in the thyroid hormone synthesis now the first step iodide trapping so iodine should enter the this uh, cell that is it should enter the thyroid gland so what are the things present there actually lobules lobules nothing but the acini so consider this as one lobule and um sorry this as one lobule this is the follicular epithelial cell and this is the colloid okay this is the colloid 
so this follicular epithelial cell so in the circulation we have iodine as iodide so iodide enters the follicular epithelial cell by the sodium iodide symport now what is the sodium iodide symport why is it entering along with the sodium into the follicular epithelial cells we know this is the basolateral side and this is the apical side okay so we know for every cell on the basolateral side will be having the sodium potassium atpase so what is the function of sodium potassium atpase it will be dragging three sodium outside the cell with two potassium into the cell so as a result what happened sodium uh, concentration inside the cell has been decreased and this will cause the sodium iodide symport to carry the sodium inside along with this iodide also comes into the cell so from here what you have understood a gradient has been developed by this uh, transport that makes this to work so what is this actually called now this is called if you recollect the concept of the transport the sodium iodide symport is a secondary active transport for which the gradient has been already set up by the primary active transport that is sodium potassium atpase so in this way via sodium iodide symport the iodide get enters into the follicular epithelial cells the first step it is iodide trapping now coming to the second step synthesis and secretion of the thyroglobulin so we know the ribosome they are called the protein factories will be synthesizing this thyroglobulin later they get packed up in the endoplasmic reticulum and finally released the released thyroglobulin undergo endocyte so i'm sorry exocytosis and enters the colloid via exocytosis it enters the colloid so i have already told what is a thyroglobulin a glycoprotein made up of 10 percent carbohydrates 123 tyrosine residues two subunits and six lakh sixty thousand of molecular weight okay now there's a th second step let's go to the third step that is oxidation of iodide to iodine so the iodide what have entered this follicular epithelial cell via pendrin a transporter named pendrin what is a pendrin sodium independent iodide chlor chlorine i'm sorry chloride transporter so the sodium independent iodide chloride transporter via this transporter the iodide that have entered the follicular epithelial cell will go into the colloid now see we in the before step the thyroglobulin have entered the colloid and in this step iodide have entered the colloid so the iodide which have entered the colloid along this apical membrane it get acted upon by the thyroid peroxidase thyroid peroxidase and get convert into the iodine molecule now i have what i have told you the raw materials for the uh, thyroid hormone synthesis is iodine and the tyrosine both of them are now present in the colloid itself see thyroglobulin will be having tyrosine residues and this iodine now the raw materials required for thyroid hormone synthesis both of them have entered the colloid now let us see the next step that is organification organification is nothing but the, this iodine molecule is there right this iodine molecule when they get incorporated at the three prime position of the tyrosine it forms the monoiodothyronine tyrosin okay so very important to note here it is tyrosin here monoiodothyrosin and when the same iodine get incorporated into the five prime position of the tyrosin it gets uh, for it forms diiodothyrosin again here tyrosin now these get attached to this thyroglobulin c this is called the organification organification is nothing but iodine combines with the thyroglobulin and forms diiodothyronin tyrosin and monoiodothyrosin okay the word sin is very important here because the sins they differ from nin because we call tetraiodothyronin triiodothyronin but here they are called monoiodothyrosin diiodothyrosin they are just iodate iodinated thyrosins okay now coming to the fifth step is condensation and the coupling reaction so what was the before step uh, it was the organification 
uh, in which the monoidothyronine diidothyronine has been formed now the monoidothyrosin when combined with the diidothyrosin forms the triidothyronin very important thyronin and when two molecules of uh, dit they combine to form the tetraidothyronin tetraidothyronin and small percentage of dit combines with mit forms the reverse t3 forms the reverse t3 now all of them get attached to the thyroglobulin so what is this entire mit dit will get converted into t3 t4 r t3 no some amount will be still left over that also will be kept attached to this thyroglobulin okay now the colloid having the thyroglobulin with attached mit dit t3 t4 r t3 it again by exocytosis it enters the follicular epithelial cell i'm sorry endocytosis it enters the follicular epithelial cell so how is this transport happening via the thyroglobulin receptors called the megalin called the megalin so after entering this follicular epithelial cell again it fuses with the lysozyme fuses with the lysozyme we know this lysozyme is rich with hydrolytic enzymes now this get acted upon by the proteases this proteases will break all this peptide bonds and release as t3 t4 this t3 t4 now get released into the circulation this is the last step that is release of the thyroid hormones now what about the mit dit mit dit they will not enter the circulation what happened to mit dit they undergone deiodination now what is this mit dit they are iodinated thyrosins so they get acted upon by the iodothyrosin deiodinase that uh, cleaves off iodide and bound thyrosin now these iodide and bound thyrosin are used for another round of the thyroid hormone synthesis so in this way they get recycled up Uh, now you might get it out why this enzyme is not cleaving this t3 t4 because the thyronins they have an capacity to resist this enzyme whereas they do not have that capacity to resist that's what i have mentioned very clearly ki thyrosin and thyronin make sure this thyrosins they couldn't resist the action of this iodothyrosin deiodinase but thyronins can resist their action and they get cleaved off and enters the circulation okay but not the mit dit now what happens if this iodothyrosin deiodinase is congenitally absent we could see this mit dit in the urine so this indicates iodine deficiency why iodine deficiency here iodine is not cleaving so when there is no cleaving there will be no supply i mean actually even we are not taking a perfect diet every day so there will be coming a iodine deficiency so appearance of mit dit in the urine in the congenital absence of this enzyme lead to the iodine deficiency so this is what the applied aspect of the thyroid hormones okay guys um that's all about biosynthesis and thank you for watching my video if you do like uh, 